Доброе утро. Доброе утро. So Andre is always here. That is nice. Thank you. Okay, but again, let's wait for just a few minutes. Dobrodra uh, Marina. For you, it's already uh, good. Good day. Good morning. Good afternoon. <laughs> Okay, so let's just wait for maybe another five minutes and we'll start.
So, okay, I would say let's let's start and uh, not wait if there are more people coming. Okay, this is uh, the last uh, morning that, or for me morning, <laughs> for me early morning actually, to, um, to, uh, that, that we um, work together here. And um, the fourth, my fourth lecture is on interferometry basics. And it is again based on material from Professor Eineder. Um, really being the expert at, at DLR, the German Aerospace Center. But um, well, two days ago on Tuesday, um, I, uh, I have to admit that there's um, many slides from an engineering standpoint that um, are, well, they are very difficult and many of them, I have to admit that uh, I cannot explain them very well. And also from, from me as a geographer, as an application person, um, I, I afterwards thought there were some of the details um, that I presented. Indeed, I'm, I'm never applying, I'm applying images. So this is why um, yesterday I looked a bit more careful through the material again, which is excellent. Um, but I will skip over some of the slides that you have and maybe because I don't know your individual interests, yeah, you, you have the material, you can look it up. Um, you can always go to our EO Earth Observation College webpage um, to look for further um, uh, in-depth uh, insight. But I added um, several slides from my lectures that I um, give here at the university to geography students um, that I think uh, from my side, they are more application oriented. So. You do not have those slides yet, obviously, because I uh, just edited them yesterday. Um, but I will send them to Misha so that he distributes them to you. And they are not translated in Russian, but I think that is really not a not a big problem. It's just a few slides, which I think, again, from my side, uh, I can explain with them better the, the what I think is relevant for an application person. So. Um, well, we talked yesterday already about the power of coherence. So today you will learn a bit more on this whole concept of interferometry and, and coherence. And again, um, I will finish this lecture today also with, uh, with two examples from our recent work so that you, you see what, what we are now doing with the Sentinel-1 time series. And I think most important, um, there are a few slides on the available software, which is probably important for you also if you want to teach uh, radar remote sensing, which could be the case. Okay. So um, Michael Einheder's lecture is built up on some milestones and the interferon formation techniques and then here he goes into details on the inside data processing sequence and phase unwrapping. And this is really information, very technical information. Um, if, if, uh, if you want to develop your, your own, own um, processing sequence, because as well in the, in the open software as in any commercial software, uh, these details that are being covered here are already included in very nice and user-friendly programs. But anyways, I mean, it's really important um, technical background, uh, but again, not so important for the applications. Good. Um, well, you, one cannot start an interferometry lecture without uh, referring to this very famous picture here on the right. This is like the, the uh, icon, the, the icon, the icon of radar interferometry. And I tell you a bit about the story behind it. Um, you may remember that uh, ERS-1, the first European operational radar satellite uh, was launched in 1991. So the first data came out about 1992, people were starting to use interferometry um, because the concept was known and now there was a radar satellite in space. Uh, so uh, the um, uh, repeat pass, so meaning one image and then waiting until ERS-1 came back, which was for ERS-1 a repeat 
orbit of 33 days. So waiting until it came back to the same location, the next image was taken and an interferogram was built. So but what you are seeing here is actually not an interferogram with which you produce an elevation model. It is an interferogram of an earthquake. So it's a representation, it's a so-called differential interferogram. It shows the magnitude and the displacement of an earthquake. And it shows it in a, yeah, well, each of these, you learned the term fringe yesterday. So each of these fringes represents 28 millimeters of change. Yeah, so each of these uh, color bars here is, is representing 28 millimeters of displacement. And as you can see, there is here this, this crack is going through and there was actually um, a displacement of one meter. So we are looking at an, a place, Lenders. It's a very, very small town, maybe 100 people. It's really, really small. It's in the desert behind uh, Los Angeles. And so this crack happened or the earthquake happened exactly on the San Andreas fault system. Yeah, so, and as you know, I mean, California is waiting for the big one. And there's always uh, large earthquakes there. And this was a big earthquake, which caused a displacement of one full meter. So very large displacement. So, and uh, here you see some, some early um, uh, publications here from 1974 uh, from uh, showing how uh, radar can be applied. So it, the concept was already understood um, that interference and interference map can be created. And then if you use further images, you can look at the changes of that interferogram over time. So the, the understanding was there to map earthquakes. And um, here, this is another publication, Goldstein, uh, one of the scientists at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, uh, NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory uh, in Los Angeles, uh, Pasadena rather, a uh, suburb of Los Angeles. Um, he published in 1988, uh, this paper on, um, this is from Death, this is Death Valley, uh, using an airborne system, but this, this is indeed an, an interferogram. So for, this would be the basis of an elevation model. And I'm, I'm saying all this because the knowledge on applying interferometry was really very, very much developed by NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory uh, sitting in Los Angeles. And now the Europeans launch ERS-1 this earthquake happens just about an hour or two hours drive away from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And this French professor, Massonet, you know, took the chance and processed the ERS-1 repeat pass data and came up with this wonderful image. And it was on the title page of Nature. So, you know, it was for the American scientists, it, it, it really was like a bad surprise that suddenly the Europeans came, came up and used the technology. And, uh, you know, I mean, nature is like you know, the biggest paper where somebody can have, uh, or the biggest journal where somebody can have a paper in. And uh, so this landed on the front page and it was just called, the title page was uh, image of an earthquake. So this was the first time that an earthquake could be visualized uh, with uh, radar data. So, you know, every radar person or annoying interferometry, if you show that image, everybody knows the story and uh, how important this first uh, differential interferogram was from 1993. Okay, so what is um, interferometry? Um, we are now using the face of our pulse. Uh, here you um, see a little visualization. So we have a reflected wave and we have a reference wave, wave to which we now compare the phase difference. And the phase itself, can be described as um, 
well, you have two pi, which is well, one full uh, wave sequence. Then, of course, the phase is, is related to the wavelength. Um, then we have to include two times r, so the range once to the Earth and then coming back. And plus a term here called phi, phi for the phase, yeah, phi or phi in English, uh, for the phase, a term that is dependent on the scatterer. So what is happening here on the ground, on the scatterer? Um, so we will now explore information that comes from this phase difference, either to a reference wave, or if we do a diffeometry to a second image acquisition. Also, for you just to understand where the, where the color comes from, it's just a visualization tool. Somebody, probably someone from NASA, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, invented to use this kind of color bar. Because again, so if you, you could represent um, uh, one full wave also as a circle, an, an electromagnetic wave can or the phase can be described um, as a circle either in 360 degrees or you describe the circle as 2 pi. So here the circle starts, pi halber, pi, uh, pi half, sorry, pi, and then 3 pi divided by 2, and then you come back at 2 pi. So going through it, measuring phases, so the phase, the, the, the amplitude peak, then there's the zero transition, the minimum, and then you're coming back to the peak, uh, um, is now being represented by colors. So this would be the representation of all the different phase differences that are possible. So here you are, depending where you start, uh, this could be the, the peak of the amplitude and then the zero transition and the minimum, and then you're back at the beginning um, of another wave and with this on, on a, of another face front. Okay, so this, this color representation, again, it's just a visualization tool in image processing. And since we are always looking at repetitions of that amplitude of the face, now we describe what is here indicated as this uh, difference to a reference wave, there we, we describe it in pi zero to two pi, and then it starts again. Okay, one more, but I said that already, obviously, um, this, how big that, what this phase difference represents on Earth is obviously dependent on one hand on the wavelength, but it is also dependent on the baseline that I talked about yesterday. Um, let's move on. Um, a complex star image that can be decomposed in intensity and in phase. Now we talked about this a lot, but I'm not sure whether you saw in your practicals already a phase image. This is how the phase image would look like. It would not give you any relevant information. It, look, it looks like speckle, it looks like noise. So this is the individual phase image. It only starts to become make sense if you compare two phase images. Okay, so here's the intensity of an island action image we did, I described yesterday or two days ago, and here's the face image. Okay, and this is <laughs> so this is one of the slides I want to uh, really skip um, because here he uh, uh, Professor Einheda is going through the calculations of these complex uh, SAR uh, codes. Uh, each pixel is described by a complex number. Um, rep and um, built up on I and K representing the amplitude and the phase. But again, this is, um, we don't need to go into all that detail because uh, again, uh, for us, we, from a space agency, if you order the, or if you download your radar image, um, well, each pixel has a complex number. What you look at is uh, either the intensity, you can see it, but you know there's also the face information and um, uh, your programs would grab out this, this phi eventually to produce an interferogram. Um, so the mathematics itself is not so complicated. Um, so there is the, the, um, this exponential term um, 
that describes the complex number. What we are looking at is the interferometric phase. So this will come up uh, again. So phase one, phi one minus phi two. So the difference between the two phase acquisitions of the two radar images that we collected. And, and so this term will come up again. So now I'm giving, um, showing you some slides from my material. And um, <clears throat> again, so this morning, <clears throat> this morning is a <coughs> uh, bad morning. I, I just, I'm just not getting enough sleep these days because of uh, the relocation of our department and teaching going on everything. So um, excuse my, my un, un, how to say, <laughs> my uh, tired voice. <laughs> okay. So, um, First, also some terms that you need to know when you talk about interferometry. We, uh, there is obviously a big difference whether we do a dual pass or a single pass interferometric calculation. A dual pass is also sometimes called repeat pass. Now repeat pass means and is defined as an interferogram built out of one satellite uh, coming again to the same position. So this would be repeat pass. The, the image of the earthquake I showed to you came from a repeat pass collection. So it was only one radar satellite. It was only ERS-1. And so the next acquisition 33 days later was used. So our delta T, T our temporal baseline, was very big, yeah, a lot of uh, 33 days in between. Um, dual pass is something we would rather describe when in those years when we had ERS-1 and 2, the two identical satellites in space, yeah, which enabled us to produce an interferogram where the delta T, the temporal baseline, was only 24 hours apart. These were the images I showed you yesterday, the coherence results from the boreal forest and <clears throat> also from, um, oh no, I didn't show you from South Africa, but um, so that is, that, that would be a dual pass. Yeah? Meaning we have two satellites in space, dual pass. Um, what else? Yeah, would also be N, NVSAT ASAR, um, now obviously Sentinel-1 and uh, one A and B would be dual pass. Um, well, any any radar satellite except except tandem X. Tandem X is a single pass interferometry uh, process. So it's it's here represented by the good old shuttle radar topography mission, which took place in February two thousand, uh, which I showed you yesterday. Also, that the photograph I have another one. I think here. Now, where the panels in the shuttle were used as an active radar system and a very long boom was extended from the shuttle with the passive antenna. So that's indicated by that arrow. Now you have here two ways, you send and receive, but here's an antenna that only receives the backscatter. So what does this mean now? There is no delta T, obviously. Yeah, you have simultaneous acquisition one antenna that sends out the signals and two that receive. And the same is true for Tandem X. And I will have some slides later. Tandem X means two satellites, but only one satellite is active and two satellites receive the signal. Yeah, Tandem X is flying very close to each other in a very interesting orbit. And only one is always active, but both receive the signal. So and this is what is the basis of interferometry yeah, it's very analog to uh, airborne or optical stereoscopy. It just means we have another angle with which we observe the surface. But very, very, very important. Single pass means there is no delta T, which means the scatterer that is causing here the backscatter is the same. Now here in the phase effect of dual pass or repeat pass, something has maybe changed on the surface, yeah, like vegetation, the leaf is not at the same place. So let's th think one step further. Here, I showed you yesterday the coherence images 
And we saw those differences in coherence on the surface only because it was a repeat pass acquisition. Now there was delta T. Here, coherence is everywhere one. There is full correlation. So these single pass interferometry emissions are dedicated to producing elevation models, digital elevation models. Now, SRTM was a mission for digital elevation models and Tandem X is, is dedicated to elevation models. No delta T, that means coherence is everywhere. The correlation coefficient is everywhere excellent. So like one, there is a little bit difference because of the different angles, but neglectable for um, the normal user, let's say. Okay, so the result um, is of a dual pass or repeat pass is reduced in variable quality of the interferogram, but only with respect to an elevation model. If I want to use coherence as an indicator of the geometry of the surface, and then I cannot use SRTM or tandem mix. I need my delta T. I need a time between the acquisitions. So these are the pros and cons, yeah, the advantages and disadvantages of these two techniques dedicated to high and constant quality elevation models. This is not so good for elevation models, but it's great to uh, analyze coherence. Okay, now how is this interferogram produced? Here we see, this is, is one nice graph and, and we will build on this. This is just the principle. Now we have these two uh, satellites. They emit wave fronts and like two stones in a water and then the waves meet. Now you, you can calculate and you can visualize this even nicely um, where these wave fronts meet and either you know, there's an additive uh, phase correlation or a destructive phase correlation like you would have it again on the water, the example with the waves. So this is causing this pattern here it's represented just in gray and white. So always a repetition. And this is what, what we saw before. Yeah? Always a repetition again of the phase condition. And what we saw before is that this pattern has can be colored with these nice psychedelic colors, uh, hippie-like colors where you will see them also. Um, there, I, I, like, I think it was a great idea to, to use this type of uh, colors. You could have used everything, but... Uh, uh, the community has accepted this type of color coding. And here we have the geometry. So we have two ranges, obviously. Um, and we have something that is called B, the baseline between the two satellites. And we can construct here a triangle. We call this the perpendicular baseline. And um, this is constructed. And, and, and this includes the, the little range difference that occurs because of the two, a different location of the two satellites. Okay, now we go into a little exercise here um, that I developed from uh, having actually an overhead projector and having transparent foils. And for this, I have to go out of the, um, the presentation mode, just a little bit this way. Is a little bit bigger for you. Let's see in a minute why I'm doing this. That okay. Now we have two here, two slides overlaying of each other. Um, the red point up here. No, okay. The red point up here represents the satellite. And so these are our pulses, our wave fronts being extended. And the funny thing is if I, if I do this now, um, the fringes appear as, uh, as we saw before. So now you see the second uh, red point up on the upper left. Um, that is the second satellite. And when I move the satellites apart, yeah, the baseline extends, the baseline gets larger or smaller. 
And the nice thing, even in this very simple geo, uh, in this very simple uh, presentation here, you see one concept that is very important. You see that the larger the baseline, yeah, the more fringes appear until I reach a point where things yeah, get so small, you cannot discriminate them anymore. Okay, going back. Now we have here a nice set of fringes. And if I get too, 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 too close to each other, yeah, and I hear it would be identical, the same. So if the baseline is too small, I'm getting only a few fringes. If I get too small, I get only a few fringes. So talking, okay, if we remember now this, this interferogram, yeah, this fringe pattern, is supposed to represent at the end an elevation model. And each of these fringes represents an isohypse, a height line. And the difference between the fringes is the equidistance. So I want to have, I want to have as many fringes as possible, as many as I can discriminate, and to have a very nice a sensitivity to the Earth's surface. Okay, that is one thing to understand as a basic. So there is an optimal baseline, there's an optimal difference between the satellites to remember that. So this is why if you want to produce an elevation model, the space agencies tell you the baseline between the satellites because it varies a little bit. Uh, depend, it, because it depends, is it a repeat pass, is it a dual pass? Um, do the space agency have a good orbit control to exactly define where the set to second satellite is, such things. So the baseline is very important. Again, I'm somehow touching my, my touch pad is moving the, this window. Okay, now the second concept, um, really basic geometry. You see that these, I may go back to this one. Now, if you have the geometry, you have the incidence angle, you know, the height. So you can actually calculate what would be the theoretical fringe pattern if you have a flat earth. Now you can calculate this fringe pattern and one more. You see that the fringes, the more you go into far range, these, this fringe pattern extends just because of the geometry. So the difference between the fringes gets bigger and bigger and bigger when you go to far range and if you have a flat earth. Okay, so now what happens if you do not have a flat earth? Well, no, I don't have to do one more. So if you have, if you have topography, uh, now look at the fringes. What happens to, to, to the fringes with topography? The slope that is facing your antenna uh, will experience more fringe transitions. You have more, more of this nice colorful pattern on the slope that is facing the radar antenna. And if you look on the other side that is facing away from the radar antenna, it may happen that only one fringe follows exactly that slope. So the topography causes, causes an alteration to that fringe pattern as compared to the flat earth interferogram. So the first step in producing elevation model is the so-called flat earth removal. And only after you calculate the difference of an interferogram for a flat earth and the interferogram that you received from the two satellites, that difference changes the interferogram into something that already looks like height lines. And from that pattern, you can then calculate the real height lines and develop the elevation model. So just remember, it's all simple geometry. Uh, and um, uh, I have some nice slides here that uh, come from the uh, from that space shuttle mission in 1994. Um, that show you very nicely that effect of interferometry. So uh, some background here, I have mentioned um, this space shuttle mission several times by now. So see, it, it happened in 1994. There were two in April and in October. 
Um, SIRC stands for Shuttle Imaging Radar C for the Americans, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. It was a third shuttle campaign. And for Germany, the German Aerospace Establishment, they added this uh, here a small X band antenna. So this is the L band, this is C band antennas, and this is a small German X band antenna. And you look into the astronauts took their picture from the cockpit and in the payload bay. And here you see the, the fin of the space shuttle. Okay, and because interferometry was so exciting, and remember, in 1993, um, the French professor had produced that interferogram of the earthquake and published it on the Nature title page. Now we are in October 94, and everybody said, let's try whether we can produce interferograms from space, but now in these, oops, in these three wavelengths, again, the shuttle mission, that was the only experiment where we had three wavelengths simultaneously in space, the X-band, the German X-band, and the American C-band and L-band. So um, I was a member of the team from the German side, and uh, so we did discuss and decided, okay, let's try that the last three days of this shuttle mission, October 94, is an experiment. We try what, how it, an interferogram looks like in these three different wavelengths. So the last three days, the astronauts, the pilots, there's always two pilots of a team of um, six astronauts. Um, they had to fly the shuttle very exactly so that that baseline that is optimal in a repeat pass fashion, only one shuttle. So three days, so we had day one, day two as the first repeat pass and day three as the second repeat pass. Um, and they had to fly it so that the baseline to this uh, position at the day before is uh, the optimal for interferometry. Okay, and I show you, and um, well, there's uh, also one further aspect related to that um, having only three days and uh, restricted power, uh, only a few data takes, so called data takes sites on our planet were selected to produce the interferogram. And one site was here in Italy, Mount Etna, because uh, many people do here geophysical measurements and uh, monitor Mount Etna, who is again and again um, showing activity. Um, uh, and another site, well, <laughs> just for your information, was actually along uh, the eastern coast, uh, eastern coast in Boyatia, um, along Lake Baikal, um, because as a matter of fact, I was working there on, on forest uh, measurements. So Boyatia is one of the very, very few uh, sites where this interferometric experiment was done. Uh, very nice data. Good. So here in, on Etna, I show you some of the results. Now we're looking at an X-band amplitude image, C-band amplitude, L-band amplitude image. And only from the backscatter, we see that the roughness causes here different uh, gray values in our, you know, just in the radar image. We see here's topography with the effects we know. Uh, um, you can already, if you look at the topography, you see already from where the radar looked at, it looked from here from up to down because those slopes we see are illuminated. The other ones are a bit more darker. Um, there's fortunately there's not really foreshortening here, but because of the steeper local incidence angle, a bit brighter. Now we have here two bright spots, and uh, if I ask you what is this, in compared also here the Mount Etna, you see the crater of the volcano. Um, so you have a bit of, and if, uh, uh, you can imagine how large that those spots are. Then. Um, and such bright returns in all three wavelengths. Yeah, you should, as a becoming radar expert now, already know ah, oh, this must be corner reflection. Yeah, very high uh, uh, backscatter, and because of the pattern, um, you could already think or ask yourself that these are cities. Yeah? These are two towns um, located here next to Vietnam. So, but what causes the difference here? This is there's no vegetation on top of Etna. It's all different surface roughnesses. And obviously, this is a roughness occurring here on the old lava areas and the sediment uh, being transported and eroded. Here is different roughnesses that are, they just have like the right size with respect to the wavelengths, three centimeters, five centimeters. 
And for the L band with the 23 centimeters, now it doesn't see much roughness differences. It's just the wavelength is too long. Okay, but this is this is the, the amplitude image. Now let's look at the interferogram uh, and at our circle of uh, repeating phases. So this is how it looks like. And, uh, well, enjoy. <laughs> So again, these are really unique results from these last three days uh, from the space shuttle campaign, Circe Exa, in April, uh, October 94, 1994. Um, so again, there's only very few um, such nice comparisons. I'm showing this to you because now you see that interferogram. You now it's best seen here at the L-band. And again, you see the diff, obviously the, the distance of our fringes is dependent on the wavelengths. Yeah, it's smaller with a shorter wavelength. And is here, the difference here, of course, is very visible because this is three centimeter wavelength, five centimeter wavelength, 23. So the difference is very well visible. So here you see actually the nicest, again, what we have been learning here. I know, uh, sorry, on the not on this slide, but on, on my slide, when I moved the two slides, yeah, that uh, on the slope facing the radar antenna, these fringes are kind of squashed to each other. And on the slope facing away from the radar antenna, they are kind of, you know, there are less fringes and they're they are moving apart because now the topography, the slope follows the incidence direction of the incoming radar waves. So very nicely shows you what's happening and also shows you nicely what's happening in topography. And uh, then uh, of course this interferogram gets kind of um, fuzzy. Um, so again, uh, that is what I was just describing. And the next step, let me just do it again. So the next step we have to do is remove this flat earth component to visualize the difference of our fringes to topography. And this is the next step. Now, only after, and this is what's said up here, phase of the interferogram without flat earth component. Now, only then the fringes close and look like isohypsis. And you can also see yeah, the equidistance. If I translate that into height lines, the equidistance is very large with a long wavelength yeah, and the sensitivity um, to the topography gets nicer, the finer the, um, the wavelength. And this was the basis then for the shuttle radar topography mapping mission, uh, same shuttle, same antennas uh, in the February 2000. Okay, um, we do a little side trip to coherence. I told you yesterday, coherence is a correlation coefficient. Um, uh, between the two complex SAR images. So it, it looks at the, at the interferometric, um, um, oh, sorry, yeah, it includes the phase information. So um, what, uh, first maybe start here with the letter. So coherence uh, as our backscatter has sigma as the Greek letter, coherence has gamma. And um, it's, a, it's really, a, a correlation coefficient is looking at the, the mean value and then dividing it by all the different uh, variations. So the, the uh, root of the, um, um, uh, what's the English word? Well, the, multi the multiplication of all the variances. So um, correlation coefficient, including the phase of these two images. And the reason to calculate the coherence was in the early days of interferometry only to get an estimate from a repeat pass radar image pair to get an estimate how well the interferogram can be constructed, how well we can retrieve height lines. So that was, again, that was a, the whole reason to start with a Co coherence map as an indicator of the quality of the final um, interferogram to produce elevation models. That, that was the whole um, background. 
And here you see again the numbers. Um, yeah, so 0.8, almost one is a very good correlation. Yeah, and you can imagine now the, the, the reason also for this single pass interferometry, because if you have no delta T, no temporal baseline, the scatter at the same position, then you get like brilliant, brilliant interferogram. Your gamma is one or almost one. Um, and it's the excellent basis for an elevation model. And here you, your program may have difficulties to follow a fringe, so to produce the height line that you want. Um, and um, here there's something, I think you do that in the practicals, this as a number of looks, um, you, can, you can filter a little bit to improve uh, the quality of the interferogram and that is being done when you have repeat pass data and uh, you want to produce an elevation model, then you go also through such filtering process to perhaps even with a very small coherence to be able to produce elevation lines. Okay. Yeah, we had this example, we looked at this yesterday, that yeah, a spec scatterer and then a result of the tandem coherence. And again, this was a map only produced to show how well you can um, develop an ele elevation model. But as a geoscientist uh, looking at the Earth's surface, you will see immediately, oh yeah, there's so much variation in here. What does this mean? And of course, that was then exploited. Okay, and um, to look into the coherence, also again, this this was a result of three repeat pass data takes. We can also look in coherence, and this is the coherency maps. Okay, and again, this, this was the backscatter, and this is the coherence. Backscatter, coherence. Backscatter, coherence. And so now, if we, if we look at these comparisons, we see well, here at the amplitude, so the magnitude or the intensity of the backscatter, we see this dependency of the roughness, which we don't see much here in Elven, just because the wavelength is too long. Um, and here we are now looking at the stability of the surface, yeah, the stability of that scatterer between one day, day. So the delta T is one day, yeah, because this is the result of the shuttle experiment. Day one, day two, first repeat pass, and then day three. And this is, of course, only of two days, uh, the coherence calculated with a 24 hour difference. So what, what are we seeing here now? We see even better where these um, lava streams went down the volcano. Uh, we get an indication for this already in the amplitude two, but here it becomes very clear. And there are regions in between that are very dark because something, meaning that scatterer on the ground, has moved between the 24 hours. Yeah, so this must be very loose material that you know, just by gravity or by wind, you know, little things in the size of the wavelength, three centimeters, five centimeters, have been changing their position between acquisition one and acquisition two. And the other ones, what is so bright, where we have high coherence, they have been absolutely stable. Nothing has changed on the surface between day one and day two. So you get this additional, and again, yeah, we are seeing, we, we, we get some indication of this already in the amplitude, um, but we get a much clearer view on this uh, using the coherence. Now looking at L-band, yeah, we, we, we see some of this also occurring. But now with Elbent, we look at things that are very big, yeah, 20 centimeters or more. And obviously such big things are more stable. And that is why you have here in the coherence map very high values and because the scatterer has not changed its position between day one and day two. So again, this is the amplitude and then maybe look at something else here, the cities that have show corner reflection for all three wavelengths, they're bright everywhere. And looking at the coherence, of course, yeah, the city is not changing. So the city has to have high coherence in all three wavelengths again. So there are no changes. 
Um, that it looks so a bit uh, like speckle again here is uh, of possibly we would have to zoom in. Maybe there's uh, some trees in the streets or gardens around the houses. And they, of course, change again the coherence. So it is not as bright as we see here, the, the, the high, very high coherence values in the lava streams. And we can continue here in the areas where a different land cover um, is existing. And we see nicely how the coherence changes with land cover for the shorter wavelengths depending on the size of the leaves of the vegetation. And here for Elbent, it's just too big. Um, the wavelength is too long. Okay, and again, we see here also variation um, on that land cover part um, that we do not see so well here in the, uh, in the amplitude. So it's really an, an unconnected additional information on the surface geometry. Okay, and um, obviously then you can ask, so, uh, well, what is L-band good for? Um, if you're looking at coherence, uh, it is, I showed you yesterday examples from tropical forests. Uh, it's a very good wavelength for, uh, to, to understand, well, denser vegetation types and the structure of this vegetation um, over, over longer time periods just because the element is, of course, reacting with the trunk, the trunks, uh, tree stems or tree trunks. Um, but, do I have the interferon coming again? One more. Um, because, uh, oops, sorry, sorry. Yeah, because the coherence is so high, you get also very nicely defined fringes. So you could retrieve your elevation lines with a good quality, with a high accuracy. Yeah, it's a wonderful pattern. But the equidistance, so the resolution, the height resolution, is not as good as with C-band. So that was the reason why after this three-day shuttle experiment, 94, it was decided if we fly a topography mission, um, we have to take the short wavelengths and C-band was then used to produce the digital elevation model. Yeah? Because you see, of course, the height sensitivity is much better. Um, it eventually, it was, I think, 10 or 12 meters from SRTN, so the height resolution. And X-band is even better, um, but well, here, yeah, then we, we get into some decorrelation problems here with the shorter wavelength. But let's, let's just stand, stand it like that. Okay. Yeah, I would say we start with this next part um, after a short break. And well, I think I just leave you this image um, because it's, it's really a unique uh, presentation of having a simultaneous repeat pass uh, interferogram again in, in three wavelengths. Not many data takes are available. Good, so let's have a short break and meet again in right, like um, uh, about 10 past. So in what are the 12 minutes, 10 past. Or any questions at this point that you want to ask? So that I'm not, um, if there is anything. Okay, then see you in 10 minutes.
So, okay, let's continue with the next part. So, um, yeah, the um, yeah, well, the title here is interferometric images must differ in at least one aspect. Um, well, either it is the angle, so our delta theta, um, and if it's single pass interferometry, then it's ideal. Uh, you're just looking at cross track, um, uh, as we've seen before, and to you can. Um, generate digital elevation models. And to be really exact, uh, what one would have to say here is surface models, uh, because of depending on the penetration depth or the, the, the wavelength you are using, you are actually mapping the, the surface. So uh, for forest height, for example. Okay, then is a special case, which is a long track, and I will have a slide later on this which is being used for ocean currents or moving objects. Um, and then we have this differential um, aspects. If there is a delta T, a temporal baseline of days or maybe even up to years, now you can um, then map um, applications would be here glacier, ice fields, lava flows, so the movement of things that move relatively fast. Um, but if you're looking at seismic events or if you watch volcanic activities over many years, crustal displacements, all of this is possible um, up to years. But this means there should not be a forest or dense vegetation on top because that will change your, your signal, obviously. But um, if you have an, uh, uh, such an activity, volcanic, volcanic order or earthquake, then... Um, uh, and you want to monitor it, uh, it works obviously best if there's no vegetation. So um, then here you see finally the word land classification with coherence estimator. Um, yeah, that is for us a very helpful additional source of information. And you see it, it may be, um, um, or here it said, what is this? I don't know what this means. Milliseconds, two years, or two, two seconds, milliseconds. Is not, uh, okay, uh, maybe in milliseconds. Yeah. Um, if, well, if, there, um, if there is time between the two uh, acquisitions, and this may refer rather to, to airborne experiments, then um, if it's a very short time difference, well, you would get decorrelation only of things that move in a fast time window. But uh, indeed, a few seconds or minutes would even be enough to cause some decorrelation in a vegetation canopy. So just always think, think really physical in the range of the wavelength that is being used in the, the scattering element and how it may change on the surface. Okay, and then this is a special uh, applications here in a delta F, so the, the frequency mod being modulated for uh, exact ranging applications, but this is something that we, that we as geographers have, have never used. Good, and I think with this I'm coming back to uh, the slides from Michael Einader, to those who came in later. Um, I have been including some slides and you will get, get them um, later for Michelle. Okay, so this is back to uh, Professor Einader's slides, and uh, this one is, looks a bit different than the one I have been shown to you, but here the same um, information content, baseline, perpendicular baseline, delta R, the delta range, uh, because of the geometry. Um, so we have the face of uh, the SAR image number one, here determined by four pi, two pi describes one full wave, and we have the two ways to the earth and back, that's why we have four pi. Then the range comes in, plus uh, whatever is happening on the ground if the scatter is not stable, um, or rather the, this phi scatter one includes what the situation is uh, during acquisition one. 
And the interferogram is um, now built up between the difference of the two different phases. And um, they are equal only if scatterer one and scatterer two are exactly at the same place, um, or they are illuminated simultaneously. Yeah, so um, as we have the case in single pass interferometry. Okay, and now, uh, well, this is from the, the slides that you have. It's the, the same thing being shown here in a, in a different way. Um, so this is very nice, <laughs> I like that. So um, you see nicer how the, uh, the, the, the color attribution um, is functioning. Uh, and then you would have, if, if this is here, your flat earth, then you have these colors, uh, repeating, 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 and the distance um, is increasing between the fringes, the more you go far uh, into far range, away from the Nadia line. And now I think it's showing a larger baseline, exactly. Yeah, it's also a nice presentation. And so closer baseline, the two satellites are closer to each other, larger baseline. And again, we see nicely how the fringes move apart with the increase in incidence and of. Yeah, and um, so the phase sensitivity now in mathematical terms, uh, you see obviously it is dependent on the angle, um, uh, but and, and um, reversely dependent on the uh, angle. But this is given from the geometry, so there's nothing you can change. Then there is a range which is fixed for satellite systems, and then the lambda, the wavelength is fixed. So yeah, the only parameter which you can uh, change is the baseline. Uh, this is this is a very powerful uh, tool to um, increase as much as possible or desired uh, that fringe pattern. But we talked about that. And then so you either um, look in the delta z direction here in the height direction, and that's yes, the sine sinus theta, um, or here in the x direction, and then it will be the tangents of theta. Yeah, and he has, of course, also an example. He's using ERS. Uh, so he is Professor Einader. This is his slides now. Um, ERS image. And um, yeah, we see here the range. We have our well-known foreshortening, even maybe a little bit of layover is here, can here be dis discriminated. Um, looks like more like a, some desert region. Um, and so here that black and brighter images come from the different surface roughnesses. And here, this is the interferometric. Um, just showing it you again. This is the interferometric phase. Yes. Still, just the interferogram, just as a result of this calculation. And then the next step is the flat interferometric phase. So the phase with just calculating the difference to the flat earth, the so called flat earth removal. And this is where when the fringe is closed. So, and you can on this one, you see also nicely, a bit better than on my example, maybe. Yeah, how when you have topography, the distance, of course, yeah, the fringes gets much smaller. And we had, so this was in range. It's not so visible that the range, that the distance increases maybe a little bit, but not that, that's, that again is not so good visible my example, but um, yeah, here you see where it's getting flat. Yeah, as a, as a topographic model, the uh, height lines and here represented by the fringes move apart. So already from the interval from you see you nicely. I'm just looking for another feature that is not visible. Okay. So same thing. Now differential interferometry is based um, on something else. It's uh, based on uh, it's focusing on how stable the scatterer on the ground is, and, and the interest in differential interferometry is, is 
specifically on whether the surface has moved. And um, now this involves that you have a reference interferogram and this reference interferogram can either come from an earlier uh, data pair that you had available, but there's also another possibility. You can actually produce such an interferogram, so like this, you can produce such an interferogram, uh, you can simulate it from an elevation model. Yeah, so if you have a nice airborne elevation model or surface model rather, and then um, there are programs available to produce an interferogram like this. In, and you, what you have to tell is what is the position of the two radar sensors, what's the height, what's the baseline, give all the geometric information, the wavelengths you're using, and then such an interferogram can be produced. So that, um, and that's here what you want to measure. If the, uh, so if here in line of sight of the antenna in, in the antenna look direction, um, to the terrain has been altered. No, but you need the reference, obviously, either an earlier interferogram um, or you produce one from a nice elevation model. That's possible too. Okay, and then some numbers here for the sensitivity uh, for the displacement. And this is an example for ERS um, with a wavelength of 5.6 centimeters C band and an in the general uh, med medium incidence angle of 23 degrees. And here you see the different sensitivities, 2.8 centimeters in range in this direction, line of sight, three centimeters in Z, so uh, vertically to the uh, Earth's surface, and uh, 7.2 centimeters in Y in, in the motion, so lateral motion away here from the Nadia line. Uh, and so this is then always surprising if you think that our wavelength actually is 5.6 centimeters, yeah, but the sensitivity now to geometric changes is in a sub wavelength domain. It's about half the wavelength. Um, and um, this is of course based that we have coherent radiation that we know what is the phase of the signals being sent out and the, the returning phase. Okay, and this uh, indeed the, these numbers increase to millimeters if we are then comparing interferograms. Yeah, uh, another example of an earthquake, uh, coast seismic deformation, BAM, an earthquake in uh, Turkey. And here again, you see uh, um, uh, actually two areas, an uplift and a subsidence. And um, this is being illustrated here by the um, um, uh, um, it's maybe a bit hard to see, but here you see that this purple color is like turning towards the, the uplift center. Now, and here you have the purple color turning to the outside. So uh, that is the representation in the interferogram of a moving towards the antenna or um, away of the antenna, because otherwise here yeah, you have only you, 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 you cannot, you always get a repetition of the phase information. So this is why you get a repetition of the color, um, but through the color coding, you can um, identify the direction. And then there's of course here, that, that was the real earthquake, the, the lateral shift um, of uh, along that continental crust. Glacier flow fields, so these are all in, in the internet. You can find all kinds of uh, very nice examples on, um, on velocity vectors. And uh, this is... Okay, with different acquisition, uh, uh, with different acquisition geometries, um, as you can see here yeah, from ascending and descending, Orbits, you can then put together a very nice, in this case, also glacier velocities and glacier directions by adding up um, 
We have here ascending, you see the ascending rectangle range. So this goes in car range and this is azimuth. Uh, so this is the flight direction. And here you have the descending orbit and the azimuth is then, so the flight direction is in this way and the range in this way. So this is the look direction of the descending orbit. And this is the look direction of the ascending orbit. And this is also the basis um, then for creating elevation models, obviously global elevation models to add up the different viewing directions because we have that problem with the strange geometry um, um, being caused by local slopes. Yeah, and uh, just one slide on the long track interferometry um, that is being used to measure velocities. And then um, a long track means that actually the antenna, like here for Terrasse X, is being divided into, into two antennas in flight direction to have now an observation again in flight direction, but from two different angles. It always stays the same um, that you need uh, two acquisitions and, and with a slightly small different viewing angle. And um, this was also an experiment done during the SRTM mission. This is you know, the, the nice boom, 60 meter boom that was laid out. And so they also did an, a long track interferometry experiment. But again, this is measured, uh, used to measure motion tidal currents, for example. And this is from a coastline in uh, Holland, Netherlands. Okay. Um, okay, this is part three on inside data processing. I don't know, one of these parts I, I will really run through quickly because um, at least this is not my expertise going into that detail in interferometric processing. Um, we in our department are mainly um, interested in well, using elevation models for um, uh, mapping forest height or using uh, coherence. And coherence is, is, is really a lot of... Uh, uh, interesting work because again you are measuring the, the geometry of the surface and I mean even Professor Einader here writes reality is with modern sensors um, more complex <laughs> but I think his slides are also already uh, quite complex I think these were the slides that I I rather you know, skip this exactly that's the part that you have the information. Again, I can only refer to the videos available on the Earth Observation College website if you want to go here into detail. This is also not part of the practicals. Misha uh, told me you are producing coherence maps and you will classify coherence maps this afternoon. So um, to, to have the, uh, because going through this type of processing, uh, we would need another week and well, all kinds of technical information. Okay, here comes our coherence um, that the formula you have seen before. Um, and it is here used as a quality indicator for the elevation model production. Then the next step would be this phase unwrapping. Ah, yeah, I think I have not used the term yet. Um, phase unwrapping is now the procedure needed, of course, to produce real, real height lines from your interferogram, from the fringes. And for this, you need somewhere a ground control point. And this is, for example, where corner reflectors uh, were used and still are being used to identify one pixel in your image with a very high uh, geometric reference. And you don't need many of these corner reflectors. I think for the shuttle radar topography mission, it was on the whole planet. I think they had about 10 corner reflectors. They don't need that much because the interferogram, especially in a global processor, that they, they all are connected to each other. So if you have somewhere one point where you know which height that is, and from there, you can start 
what's called face unwrapping, yeah, to unroll the face and give it the, the height information, assign a height information. And you know what the fringe distance, what it means, what is the sensitivity to height. You saw the formula before, the, set, the height sensitivity um, of a sensor with respect to geometry, the incidence angles and the wavelength and the range. And um, so then you can, you can trust that you are uh, actually assigning the correct height. Phase unwrapping, all these nice terms. Yeah, phase unwrapping. And again, here we look into two images, a good fringe quality. And you see, uh, again, this whole de debate on coherence came from the 90s when we had the repeat pass uh, orbits of or rather dual pass from ERS 1 and 2 with 24 hours between here, an example from 13th and 14th of January, or here on from 23rd and 24th, a similar area, uh, but obviously uh, maybe vegetation developed, um, I don't know which geographical site that exactly is, but you see the fringes, uh, you, you, you cannot follow all the, all the fringes nicely which means you cannot produce an elevation model. Okay, and then he goes uh, really into details of the phase unwrapping problems. Um, 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 and because of the, uh, the uh, ambiguities that some of, some of these uh, phase differences show, but again, this is, we honest, I've never needed to know that in detail, um, I rather, if this, but I'm, I'm also, I'm not a geologist. So I'm not using uh, interferometry for surface uh, development, but rather for um, uh, the surface mapping of land cover and forests. Yeah, you see, so that there, there are ambiguities where um, you can, just from the face information, you may not be sure who, here, for example, is a, uh, there would be a gap in you, for, only from the face, from the unwrapping the face, it, the, the topography could look like this, um, but sometimes you have to interact and then obviously uh, give the information that the face unwrapping should follow up to a peak in this case of this volcano. So I just move really on because I, So anyways, you have all this information now nicely in Russian. <laughs> if you're interested to go in further detail, you can um, refer to your slides. Now, the typical residual distribution. I mean, it is very exciting to listen sometimes to these uh, talks and see the, the problems that occur because the fringe patterns are not so um, Clear and here, this actually you see this is an example from the shuttle radar topography mission um, from the German expand antenna. And although this was a single pass, again, due to this may be geometry, um, but it may also be some um, uh, effects, maybe from a dense cloud that was in the way between the radar antenna and the backscatter location. So there, there may be problems where you have to find solutions how to follow such a, such a fringe, yeah? because eventually the whole purpose was to produce a nice elevation model. So these are, of course, problems then the, uh, in this case, the radar engineers had to deal with how to program to come to a nice result. So residuals in nature <laughs> is an example from the great uh, Escher paintings. Okay, we move on to the next part, um, INSAR satellites and examples. So um, obviously the uh, uh, tandem, uh, well, this is here Terrasa X, but we have the same satellite orbits as for optical sensors, descending uh, sun synchronous orbit. Um, the height is all on this, uh, uh, a geo orbit between 500 and 900 kilometers height. 
velocity is always the same orbit period, 90 to 100 minutes. Um, so this you should know all this from your optical uh, satellites if you work with thermal sensing. And the scene dimensions now depend on the uh, um, on the sensor characteristics, whether it's a so-called high resolution spot modus or uh, it's a global monitoring or white swath. So with radar, you have uh, differently than to um, uh, optical centers, you uh, have different options. Yeah, ES-1 was already introduced to you. It, ES-1 worked from launch 91 and worked until 2000. Um, then it had a fixed bandwidth uh, two days ago. I talked briefly about this uh, chirp, the pulse being um, constructed from a modulated frequencies and then the bandwidth plays a role and defines the resolution. With, with Terrasa X, you can choose between different bandwidths, but ERS1 has only one bandwidth and one geometric resolution with this. Yeah, and it had a not 33, 35-day repeat. So um, yeah, repeat pass interferometry would only work 35 days. It had uh, some special orbit conditions for a special focus. Um, there was a three-day repeat pass in the beginning of the satellite's life for mapping eyes. Yeah, um, initiated cross-stick along TRAXAR interferometry um, because it was such a wonderful in instrument. And then ERS2 was being launched in 1995, the uh, equivalent satellite. Here you see it in the clean room um, in Toulouse, in the test facility. Um, yeah, here in an anachoric chamber uh, where the, uh, the radar instruments here, the radar antenna, have been tested. Um, that's just something else I wanted to say. Um, ah, yeah. Uh, originally, ERS-1 was, was constructed to work only for a maximum of five years, rather only three years. And that's why they launched uh, ERS-2 in 1995. Um, um, but because the satellite really worked so nicely, we had the two satellites in space, which enabled the first interferometric tandem mission. Um, yeah, and ERS-2, I think actually ERS-2, it, it could still be working. Um, no, I'd have, I haven't followed it up, what happened to ERS-2. Yeah, again, the highlight that I uh, showed in the beginning of this lecture, and uh, yeah, this is from that paper from Massonet, the Nature paper, that is the differential interferogram of that earthquake. And this is a result of um, measurements that were taken by the geophysicists in the area. So this is a simulated a model of the uh, differential interferogram. Um, where you can see how, again, this is from geophysical measurements, point measurements, and then an in, in, in interferogram constructed. And you see how the reality, at least for the major fractures uh, that happened here, uh, is, is being covered. But it also shows that some other highlight areas of that earthquake are visible here on the real data uh, which are being missed by a model based on a few locations. So that's obviously always in remote sensing the case that the raster image uh, yeah, spatial mapping gives, gives uh, wonderful information. Yeah, some further examples. Um, here we are seeing uh, uh, Terrasa X um, yeah, interferogram based on a very high geometric resolution, the so-called spotlight resolution. You see here the bandwidth is here 300 megahertz. And um, here we have, let's see. This one, yeah. um, why is showing that uh, yeah, because of the height uh, resolution here on some buildings, and again, because this is uh, such a, a nice geometric resolution, you see even how the fringes uh, move up uh, on these uh, skyscrapers. So these are also there's a plenty of such illustrations in the internet um, that that show the capabilities of 
high resolution interferometry. Yeah, SITM, I mentioned before, the single pass mission, 11 days in February 2000. Um, it was a dedicated single pass interferometer and a global elevation model. The first global elevation model was constructed between plus minus 60 degrees latitude um, and plus minus 60 degrees. That means some of the Russian Northern territories are missing. It means Great Britain is missing, Canada is missing, uh, Scandinavia is missing, um, but this is uh, based on the orbit that the shuttle uh, can fly. Yeah, the inclination of the orbit, like the, like the ISS, the International Space Station, the inclination of the orbit is such that um, the highest latitude is uh, 60 degrees. Okay, so this was a very, very exciting uh, shuttle mission. It were exactly the same antennas like in 1994, um, but well, the excitement was this 60 meter boom um, and the passive antenna at the end, it was unfolded, it was the first time in the year 2000 that such a large experiment took place in space. Um, of course, also very dangerous for the six astronauts. And let me see next one. No. Um, well, I was part of the, um, the payload team, so for mission control in Johnson Space Center. And uh, I, I was on the last shift when the the boom had to be retrieved back into the shuttle payload bay. And um, when I went on shift in the Johnson Space Center, there was a big panic everywhere because the, uh, the boom had not enfolded correctly. There, there was a lid that covered um, the box where the boom went in and that had not closed. And it meant that if that was not closed, the shuttle could also not close the payload bay and it could not return to Earth. That, that was actually the situation. And um, the NASA staff had uh, tried several techniques. They have discussed several techniques. They even had an emergency procedure. Um, they had little uh, well, dynamite, <laughs> little explosive elements here on the boom because they had envisaged if there is any problem, we have to get rid of that boom, uh, the 60 meter structure, uh, so that we can close the shuttle payload bay. Um, but this, of course, had never been done in space before, yeah, having little explosions, and it was really unclear what would happen to uh, the shuttle orbit doing such things. So that would have been the very last uh, possibility. And after many hours, they then finally decided to just let the mechanism off. So they turned this drawing mechanism off. And when they turned it on, so obviously it had released some tension when they turned it on again, the lid closed. And uh, I, will, I will never forget that moment because uh, it's, it was really dramatic. Um, yeah, and then the lid closed, the payload bay was closed, and about a day later, the shuttle returned safely back. And as it was the case in the year 2000, all the precious data were stored on tapes um, inside the cockpit. So everything was full with magnetic uh, uh, high density tapes that had recorded the global, the first global elevation model. So it's still a wonderful data set to use and it's free um, to everybody. Yeah, and uh, here we see some of the parameters that had been used. And so, uh, well, the, this whole campaign was paid or the mission was paid to produce a, a global elevation model. Now a shuttle, because of the energy, it can only fly 11 to 12 days. So we had to calculate what is the swath width required if we have only 11 days to cover the whole planet. So you just have to divide your equator length, <laughs> um, you know, 40,000 something kilometers um, by let's say 10 days um, to understand how large the area needs to be at the equator that is being covered per day. 
And this was only possible by a, um, a, a nice radar technique um, called Scansar, which was here applied and is also applied now with Sentinel or with the Canadian radar set, where these, uh, there is a so-called beam steering. And in that case, you see there was the C-band and then also the, uh, um, the electronic parts responsible for the horizontal polarization and the vertical polarization where they all turned on to come up to a swath width of 225 kilometers. And that was exactly the width needed. There was only, I think, seven kilometers overlap at the equator to collect data um, up in 11 days um, for a global elevation model. Okay, one further aspect, you see here XV, this is uh, well, our little x antenna here had a much smaller swath. So the German antenna did not produce a global elevation model, but it has a higher uh, height sensitivity, a better height resolution because of the shorter wavelength. But it and it looked, you know, I made the remark yesterday, I think, um, yeah, the expert, of course, we could choose which incidence angle to use, but the more you go towards near range, yeah, that worse the geometric effects in topography, so layover or foreshortening. So we choose here an incidence angle of about 56 degrees. Now then you get the problem of shadow, but again, well, for the global coverage, you have ascending and descending, you look from both sides to the topography, and then you cover the shaded sites, uh, ra radar shaded sites as well. Okay, let's see. Other thing, well, orbit height here, similar, of course, as for the International Space Station, much lower orbit. Okay, I think there's nothing else. What is, oh yeah, your yeah, baseline, of course. Yeah, the baseline is then yeah, def defined by the 60 meter boom. And um, before the shuttle was launched, uh, many years before, First, the uh, uh, engineers said, well, we only send out a boom with 30 meter length, um, just because 60 meter has never been done before in space. And there are six people here in the cockpit that uh, have to come back safely. So 30 meters, um, but with a 30 meter baseline, remember yeah, the, there is this optimal baseline to get more fringes. And it turned out that the height requirement that was um, announced, um, a 60 meter baseline was needed. So 30 meter baseline would have been too close, not enough fringes to come up with, I think the requirement was a 15 meter height resolution. And this could only be acquired with 60 meters. So it was quite an adventure really also in an engineering sense, uh, absolute marvelous uh, mission. Yeah, and uh, again, as a German and a, a Italian space agency was also involved um, working on the expand ground processor. So it was a nice uh, Italian, American, German cooperation. Yeah, and here an interferogram. Uh, I have shown you the Etna before. Volcanoes are, of course, always nice. Uh, this is uh, SRTM. You see the little letters, shuttle radar topography, but from our expense sensor from Ecuador. And looking in and just these marvelous, beautiful fringes, very clear because it's single pass interferometry. And this is then um, the uh, elevation model, geocoded and of course colored uh, with image processing to look like uh, an Atlas type elevation model. Yeah, let's just show you that's uh, it's just the interferometer is really a marvelous technique. Okay, and here from Professor Einleder's slides uh, showing black and white, uh, the Etna, what I have been showing you before um, for the three different wavelengths during the second shuttle campaign, the repeat bus. Okay, now last slides to Tandem X, uh, Germany's current Earth Observation SAR mission. Um, well, Germany has been working on decades on X-band technology. So that is why we also contributed the X-band radar antenna to the shuttle radar topography mission. Um, and uh, from there, uh, uh, the German space agency went on to develop 
a operational concept for operationally mapping the surface with XPAN to have high geometric resolution. And so they developed this concept of flying two satellites in a very close constellation in a very special orbit. So, um, and here they, the, the main mission goal was to produce a global high resolution uh, uh, HRTI3 a digital elevation model where the height resolution is now, I think the nominal was five meters. And um, yeah, very a long track also, but for us important is here the cross track baseline. Okay, and now um, to this very special orbit. Have we, well, I guess you, you understood hopefully yeah, that there is an optimal baseline needed to produce a nice interferogram. And uh, also it should be single pass. Yeah, there should not be a delta T, no time between the two acquisitions. So the idea here is to bring these two satellites closely to each other and always one is sending, but two are receiving. Um, there's also an, another advantage uh, with these two satellites that they actually change uh, responsibilities. So um, about 15 to 20 minutes, a uh, satellite has enough power for uh, energy for the radar antennas. Um, so after, after 20, and the one orbit is 90 minutes. So after 20 minutes, it has to pause for 70 minutes to uh, get to restore its, its batteries from by solar power. And actually these two guys, this is a solar panel here to the top. They fly along the day-night border to always face towards the sun um, to get enough energy. So 20 minutes, one is working and then it's shutting off and the other one takes over and sends out 20 minutes. So now you can extend the acquisition time to 40 minutes uh, for a 90 minute orbit. Okay, one other thing is you, you, you can't let them, you cannot let them fly behind each other um, then the baseline requirements would not be fulfilled. So the orbit engineers um, came up with this idea to have the two satellites fly in this helix pattern. So you see this here, there is, a, there is always the optimal baseline kept either in a vertical or here in a horizontal uh, distance. And um, now you cannot have two rings, you, you have to have these, these orbits like turning around each other because two rings would be sometimes you know, uh, too, too close to, it, to each other or too far to each other. So these two satellites are really dense in orbit. So they, they dance around each other. And um, I'm not really sure why that is necessary, but they also change the position. So um, probably it's the, the active one is well either in front, yeah, probably in front, um, and after the 20 minutes, it, it gets slower and, then, and the other one takes off the leading position and sending the radar pulses and both receive only, or the second one receives only. So they're dancing around in position one, position two, and around each other. And this concept is, um, let's say, so interesting that uh, when this was first presented at a conference, the IGARS, our largest uh, remote sensing symposium, they were, uh, I've never seen that in a conference, there were standing ovations. Uh, the people really, everybody got out of the chairs and they were just applauding the, the engineers from um, the German Aerospace Establishment and the industry uh, that was involved in developing the, the, the satellites. And I think there are several countries, and I, I thought actually Russia too, that um, wanted to buy this satellite and apply the same con the same concept. But I don't know where they where they are. So uh, these are I can just encourage you to go on a deal of web page and look for the examples um, of this wonderful uh, implementation of interferometry. Very high resolution, but always remember it's a surface. It's actually a surface model. Now the X band penetrates maybe one meter into the canopy, so it's indeed also a forest height map with a coarse accuracy about a meter plus minus. But it shows you nicely the um, the, the, the topography or 
plus what is on the surface. There's an example um, from Alaska. So again, there's uh, lots available. Um, and for scientific purposes, you can apply for if you have a test site, you would like to uh, look at these high resolution elevation models, um, you can apply and get the data for free scientifically. Um, and of course, commercially, you can buy larger areas and that is of course done. Of course, also a nice example here um, from some region yeah, let's assume probably uh, let me say somewhere um, and yeah well zooming in you see uh, especially all the, the forest height difference very nice data so the first uh, global data set was finished in 2016 and globally a 90 meter reduced resolution version was released in october 2018 and and is available but again the, the 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 real resolution is much better but for, but for that you have to apply it with a proposal scientific proposal or buy the data okay um that's that's really the top notch of of interferometry applications and going on so just just really search <laughs> internet okay then um dm applications here an example um, using these uh, elevation models now over time in the northern and southern Patagonian ice fields yeah, and such. And this is now not from uh, like what is done over Greenland with the uh, ISAT with an altimeter. This is now following very high resolution elevation models over time and this is from 2011 to 2014, just three years. Yeah, and uh, then you can just by uh, following the, the surface model, see the changes here in this case of these uh, two glacier systems. Yeah, so really uh, interesting and, and very, very important data sets to monitor the rapid change that we humans are causing to our planet. Yeah, now we come to additional material from, from me. But I, I think it's always nice to have just a few minutes. Um, uh, let's just say we start five, five past. So just an eight minute break that, you know, get up or get a coffee or something. Um, are any questions to um, to these applications of the elevation models. No. And also not in the chat. Okay, then see you in eight minutes.
Okay, so um, let's continue with the final slides. And um, also here, as I said in the beginning, <coughs> I added some material that um, you will receive then um, later from uh, Misha. And uh, well, unfortunately, we don't have the Russian, Russian translations for this, but I think that's not so um, important because you understand English and it's not there's not so much text on these ones. Okay, so um, I'm showing you some results from I think from two projects that we run, and again I can uh, like to refer you also to our web pages here. Um, one project. Um, is called uh, ZALDI, the South African Land Degradation uh, Monitor. And here you can find all kinds of information on the, the, the work that we are doing in South Africa. And uh, I wanted to show you here just a few slides, but um, what we try to explore in, in this context. So obviously, um, there is there are degradation indicators actually given to us by the South African colleagues. Um, so obviously there's like an extension of bare soil, maybe something, but uh, it's also the, the change of certain land use types that are causing more erosion, for example. Um, then a big issue is uh, the um, uh, well, bush encroachment in the savanna systems um, based on grazing techniques or grazing practices rather. Then there is um, in, in uh, grassland, so in used pasture systems, there is a problem of, a, of an encroachment, not of a bush, um, it's an encroachment of a fork, so a perennial, a perennial plant, the so-called slangbush, and it's 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 a plant that its home is South Africa, but with changing climate, the um, changing precipitation system, it's this this plant spreads uh, in a, a quite uh, that's a large dynamic, and the um, um, the animals used in that rangeland they are not eating this form. So this increases even more the spreading um, of this specific plant. And with this, it's very hard to take it out of the uh, of the soil because of, it, of its root system, um, and. So it is actually responsible for large area, large areas being lost to the local farmers um, for their income with grazing. Um, so that, that is in a, in a sense degradation because I mean everybody, well, how do you define degradation? I should start with that. How do you define degradation to a certain surface? Uh, there may be uh, interests from environmentalists for them, a surface is never degraded, even if it changes with, uh, with climate change. But for people using a surface, it is degraded if they cannot use it longer. So that's a, de a definition that is used by the United Nations, uh, saying that um, land should be used in a sustainable manner. Uh, so yet the, you know also the future generations can can live off the land. So uh, degradation is, is is complex because um, yeah, some some of the land use, for example, in South Africa, we see a, a tremendous dynamic again forest, even forest being changed to macadamia macadamia plantations. Obviously, the whole world likes to eat macadamia nuts now. And so um, we see very large parts, whether it was formerly agriculture, pasture, or forest being changed to macadamia. And um, the way it is planted enforces erosion. Um, so it's very obvious that uh, 
what is being done now by large companies is not sustainable. It, it's possible that maybe in 20, 20 years already, um, or latest 30, 40 years, that land cannot be used anymore because the soil has eroded. Um, this is not everywhere the case. There are some responsible owners who uh, try to work with uh, grass or weeds to keep the soil stable, even in a plantation of macadamia nuts. Um, so there, there are differences. But yeah, um, that means monitoring degradation requires, um, of course, local knowledge. You have to work with the local experts. But you have to also very creatively work with your classification algorithms. And uh, so, well, the spatial resolution is important, the temporal resolution is important, and the understanding of that spatial temporal signal that, that you want to work with. Um, and with this, I mean, the sentinels are just overwhelming. Sentinel-1, Sentinel-2, 10-meter geometric resolution, free data, um, there is a lot of what's called the ARD analysis ready data available. So you don't even have to go through pre-processing problems anymore, also for radar. Um, so the, the, we as geo geographers or geoscientists, uh, environmental experts, we can jump right into all the problems of um, time series analysis. Okay, so we really have to say we are in a, in a new era in the last six, seven years, six years maybe, in a new era of remote sensing, um, which requires new techniques, but we should never forget my motto, treat each pixel with respect. We should never forget that behind the time series and all kinds of machine learning approaches, there is a physical uh, information and content to the pixel. So what we are trying to do is uh, one thing is, of course, going directly from the data into machine learning approaches, um, support vector machines, um, uh, was random forest, uh, different uh, K clustering, network clustering techniques. Um, so there is a, a whole bunch of, of processes available as uh, or programs available. You don't even need to program. They are sitting out there. You know, what is one like our postdocs? They like to use GitHub um, uh, as a source of of uh, codes in um, you know, uh, mainly the programming in Python. Um, well, many also MATLAB or R, but. Uh, Python seems to be developing mostly. So you have scripts available that you can use, all your commercial softwares, um, even as part of SNAP, there are possibilities. And we will learn more about this today and tomorrow in the practicals and uh, especially tomorrow. Okay, so um, again, they're going directly into such machine learning approaches, but they depend also on training. Um, this is why then the, um, the in situ campaigns become very important. Um, but another aspect is that's uh, very close to, to my heart, at least, is to go to the biophysical retrievals. Yeah. <clears throat> Which means uh, we are also uh, exploring indices, um, like NDVI would be the most famous, or SAVI, the Soil Adjusted Vegetation Index. Now we have a list, I think, of 12 uh, optical indices that are also going into the machine learning approach, um, sometimes combined. So th this is where we are now in the last year of the project. Yeah, how do we combine, how do we synergistically explore radar and optical data um, on the data level or on the product level. So for radar, there's not so much available, but um, what uh, we are developing is, one is this woody cover map, what I showed you yesterday, yeah, which is very much based on, uh, on the regression. So we, again, we need information, in situ information. But now things come together and become interesting yeah, with radar, we know, again, the three ground phenomena radar reacts to is surface roughness. Uh, it's a ge geometry of the scatterers and it's the moisture. Now, if we have a bare earth, 
bare earth could still give a lot of backscatter if it has a certain roughness. Bare soil will also influence our time series depending on the soil moisture. Yeah, so we need an estimate, for example, on bare soil. And there are optical products giving you bare soil. So we have to merge now these products, um, for example, doing a woody cover retrieval only in areas where the optical data gives us uh, uh, that there is no bare soil. Uh, so I, I think it's, I mean, it's really a lot of fun, but it's also very difficult to say, okay, how do we combine um, to the best of our knowledge what we have now available from, what is it, I think 13 channels that Sentinel-2 has um, and our radar, we have only C-band, VV and VVH or HH and H3. Now, what else is a radar biophysical retrieval? There are, uh, sometimes there's something like a radar vegetation index that is being developed. Um, it can only be, be based, or until now, it was only based on the, um, the difference of the VV to the VH channel. And then there the, is a difference and sometimes a ratio is included. Now, yeah, because, well, we know, you know also by now, VH, the cross-polarized channel, is the one that is directly related to vegetation volume. Now, so it's nice, but C-band, five centimeter, it's not the optimal wavelength, but anyways, that's what we have. Now, so there is a vegetation index. Um, then there is a further, so we have the woody cover product, we have a radar vegetation index, um, then we have a soil moisture product, so soil moisture is also an interesting product from radar, but you have to make sure that what you're mapping, is it indeed related to the soil moisture or is that moisture of the vegetation? So here, for example, an NDVI product may come in useful uh, to separate what is here going under vegetational development or the bare, oil, bare earth uh, product can help. Um, so in talking about soil moisture, uh, there are approaches, again, using regression, but you need the time series. So what they do is um, pixel for, by pixel, you look into, let's say, a yearly development um, of your time series and related to vegetation, it would be a slow trend. Yeah, the vegetation develops, more leaves, more water, more backscatter, and then the, the, the vegetation dries out or it's been harvested. That may be an abrupt change, but other than that, a, a slow change. With the soil moisture or changing moisture content also in the vegetation, it reacts very soon. You have a precipitation event. And so abruptly, your backscatter increases due to the increased moisture. So what these soil moisture models try to separate is the slow development from a rapid development of changes. And then you connect it to precipitation information that you have um, to see what the, whether your interpretation is right. So um, again, but with C-band, we have not much penetration in the soil. Yeah, even if there is no vegetation on top, um, we could only, okay, this is another take home message. Yeah, how deep is the, layer from where we get the radar information as a rule of thumb, uh, we say it's one tenth, one tenth of the um, wavelength. Uh, was it yesterday or two days ago, I showed you a graph that in the Sahara, uh, the L-band system can penetrate a meter up to two meters. So it's actually a multiple of the wavelength, but that is only true in a hyper arid really arid region where you have no water in the, in the soil. In Russia or in Germany, in, in the most uh, temperate regions, we always have some water in the, in the soil. And um, so th this rule of thumb is one tenth of the wavelength, meaning for a five centimeter wavelength C-band, it's only five millimeters. Yeah? So what we measure is really the uppermost, the top layer of the soil in the changing moisture, which is still important and interesting for many like hydrological models, climate models, 
but also locally uh, to understand is there a, what is the soil moisture distribution, for example. Okay, so there are obviously, you can also talk about the quality and errors of the optical products that have to be considered as well, but all of this then goes, um, well, either from a biophysical retrieval directly into, into um, now a combination to come up uh, with this degradation indicator. Uh, what I said before, again, to start, what is a degradation indicator? It could be, for example, this bush encroachment. Now, where is it happening? Um, yeah, where is, mainly where and when is it happening? Um, or is there a change in the uh, in the vegetation development over the years? So this would be another an, uh, another one. Okay, all of this, and this is of course also technology everywhere available, is then handled in a data cube, um, so where everybody can have access to the procedures and further develop um, well either the methodology or just update what is in there month by month because a monitor means you give immediate feedback to the local farmer or the local government and you said this that's the situation what we see from space okay yeah and um, this is one example i want to show you that was uh, uh, published this year from uh, here my department together with uh, colleagues from South Africa and from the German Aerospace um, Center uh, using Sentinel-1 and 2 time series for this. This bush is called Slangbos, the Slangbos mapping in South Africa. But what I want to show you is uh, you now the time series, Yeah, how interesting they get uh, when you add the coherence. So um, this is just a really simple, straightforward example looking at four different land cover types. Slangbos is this four it's, it's again a perennial plant getting a height well, up to one meter maybe. It has woody compartments, it, it has a strong root system, and again it loves climate change and is spreading over the grassland. So we want to separate that from grassland, natural grassland or pasture. Um, then of course we have cultivated land, agricultural land with changes, and we have woodland. And here, this is uh, the, the, the precipitation patterns uh, on this area. So this is now a filtered average line uh, from a few pixels, a segment with clearly only having the type of land cover. And uh, what we compare here is the, um, uh, the uh, uh, Sentinel-1 um, VH backscatter. Yeah, and we compare it. Um, and just, I'm not, okay, and, uh, this is the, yeah, the axis for the backscatter, and this is the axis for the NDVI and the SAVI, the Soil Adjusted Vegetation Index, and the VV coherence. Yeah, so, ah, yeah, this is one more thing take home message um, coherence. So this interferometric product can only be calculated uh, from co-polarized channel you know, because um, then you need to stay in the same polarization plane when you want to produce an interferogram. Um, so with the VH, yeah, you would you change the polarization plane as discussed the last days in the system. You cannot produce a co coherence map. Okay. So we're looking at backscatter, VH, because it's related to volume, volumetric scattering, VV coherence, NDVI and SAVI, and this is the axis because NDVI and coherence, they go from zero to one. There are the colors, um, this bluish and, and the brownish color is the radar, and then green, NDVI and black is SAVI. And we're starting in 2016, um, then uh, when Sentinel-2 was launched. Uh, and you see here, for example, um, this pattern, and that's what I wanted to show you explicitly, is um, this is textbook-like. Uh, you have here yeah, the blue line is the backscatter. It increases the southern hemisphere. You have in the winter season, you have precipitation. So you are like a nice, actually like a nice NDVI signal. Yeah? The, 
the big skitter increases with the development of the leaves, as the NDVI increases with the development of the leaves. And the SAVI is adjusting for the soil. So this is a whole different story then because here soil reflection is included and you see, I mean, this is a higher level product and it, uh, it's, it's a more advanced actually than the NDVI and um, giving a little bit in principle similar development, but the amplitudes of this time signal look different. Okay, then we have in the southern hemisphere uh, summer, the vegetation dies, so NDVI goes down, the big skeleton goes down, and the coherence goes up. Yeah, so textbook. Vegetation is dying, meaning less scatterers, yeah, less water-filled leaves, less scatterers. So the correlation coefficient of your phases increases. So usually you have this very nice pattern of backscatter and coherence like going against each other. Yeah? Once the backscatter goes up, the coherence goes down. Yeah, must, because there's more leaves, there's more scatterers. Yeah? But in some years, and that's this really interesting stuff, in some years, something is different. And so we see one thing is the amplitude is changing. The amplitude, now I'm talking about the amplitude of this time signal here. Yeah, this is a, this is, there's a famous program, TimeSat, with which to analyze uh, NDVI amplitudes. So the uh, NDVI time series, it's looking at the height of that amplitude, it's looking at the width, it's looking at maxima and minima over a year, all, all this. So you, you get higher level statistics from the time signal. Um, yeah, so here we see there's something coherent, something is reacting to something on the ground. It's, it's going up, up already to at an earlier stage than in the, in the preceding and the following year. Yeah, so these are indicators now that we can only observe because we have this wonderful Sentinel 1A, B, and C coming up, and Sentinel 2A, uh, B, C coming up. Um, in space with a nice time series. And again, just looking at these really generalized uh, and filtered lines, yeah, you see that here, for example, for the grassland, um, the uh, VH backscatter, yeah, here it, the, the, the overall level of backscatter, just looking at the blue line now, here we are between minus 17 to 19 dB. And here for grassland, we are between minus 19 and minus 21. Yeah, so also the absolute level of the backscatter can be an indicator, can be used in a classification system to uh, separate between slangos and this, this invading bush and grassland. And obviously, I mean, for cultivated, there are all kinds of different effects coming in because of the land use. For woodland, um, we have more stable signals because it doesn't, uh, change that much. Maybe it's even perennial uh, woodland, so no, um, not dropping the, the leaves. Um, yeah, but putting these signals now together in context um, gives an excellent basis for a monitoring system. And again, the sentinels are guaranteed financially for the next decades to come. So whatever you build up, you're building it up for the future and it can be used in the, in the future. So um, right now we are really in the, uh, two graphs on this, we are um, exploring the data. Yeah, because some of it, of course we can, like I just said, yeah, I can interpret what's happening here, but what I want is an operational monitoring system that identifies that pixel belongs to this land cover type and it undergoes right now a certain environmental condition, yeah, a drought um, or maybe too much precipitation, or it identifies here as a change in the land cover. And yeah, okay. Yeah, this is uh, now looking really into the pixels. Um, a master student from us is, uh, is working on uh, identifying like pure pixels and just following up the time series. He's starting in 2016 now until the end of 20. And down here, the two lines here, the brownish ones is NDVI and uh, the greenish one down here is the soil adjusted vegetation index. And this is 100% grassland. And then we have in blue here only backscatter, VH and VV. 
Yeah, and if I have not mentioned it, and I mentioned it now, the the VH signals, the cross polarized, are always lower because well, we are, I did mention it yesterday, yeah, because we we are receiving, of course, the depolarized uh, energy. Um, yeah, so no no wonder. Um, but we see that uh, the the VH uh, uh, sorry the the VV signal here. Uh, even though it is 100% grassland, we have a lot of variation. So um, the message to take home from, from this graph is that um, yeah, don't get too frustrated with looking at single or, or even a few pixels that have a 100% cover. Um, one thing is, of course, the speckle we talked about. But for, and, and to this, you need to do filtering either on a spatial level or you go in a, uh, use a multi-temporal filter. Uh, but on the other hand, you don't want to suppress uh, maybe these little peaks that we see here. And the student obviously has to put in now the precipitation information uh, because, I mean, first of all, we see here that pixel uh, before it was somewhere here in this whole bunch of pixels, but here it's moving apart. So the question is, what is happening here? then there are these peaks that may be related to uh, precipitation events. And, but on the other hand, I cannot see the same pattern happening down here. Here is something in the NDVI yeah, where we can say, ah, uh, maybe there have been some rain events in between that increase the grassland in the time frame. Yeah, and here in the VH, um, I don't know, maybe it's wishful thinking, but, but uh, I see that peak also coming up. So um, we need tools now to, uh, and there are tools available, but the, the, the um, it, it will be a very fine tuning on how to interpret these time signals um, to get obviously a meaningful result out of it, but not to suppress any small scale information and small scale in the sense of spatial or temporal, yeah, suppress any small scale information that may be exactly the indicator we are looking for or want to identify that on a specific region something is happening. Yeah, and um, just to show you, this is, uh, uh, again, um, this is a 100% one land cover. This is savanna grass, and this is a, uh, some of these acacia trees. And um, oops, uh, so now, uh, first of all, if you look at the um, at the level of the backscatter, uh, now we see how the radar. Uh, it's the same axis descriptions how the radar jumps up and down, similar as what we have seen before. Yeah, so there is a general behavior. And of course, the tree is also more stable over the years. Um, oops. Yeah, but we see also how the NDVI and the SAVI are uh, here for the trees. Uh, interestingly, the NDVI, these are several tree pixels. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Now yeah, that here the NDVI shows variations. So, let's say an algorithm just based on the NDVI may do some misclassification or otherwise it may reveal some important issues in that year. Um, because if you see that amplitude looks very different than the other ones. Um, and also something is happening here, especially in the VH uh, channel again, there's um, something strange in, the, in these dates. Yeah, so we can already visually uh, uh, interpret it. Okay, um, yeah, and here is not even, so this was only a VH and VV, there's not even the coherence included. So that was one um, of the work we are doing. And uh, then also this is in German, what it talks about is uh, uh, agricultural, well, radar, the name already says it, radar crop monitor. And again, well, I'm, I'm very much interested on a pixel level what's happening. And we have here a nice uh, PhD student, Lenara Aslanova from Kazakhstan, uh, working with us um, on this on this exploration. And um, here, our problem is mapping heterogeneities uh, in the fields. And here for Germany, 
Um, now maybe it's not really a problem in Siberia or maybe in the Moscow region, I don't know. Um, where is it here? This guy. Uh, these guys are making trouble to the farmers. Yeah, we have uh, many wild boars and um, uh, well, because there are hunting restrictions, they live happily and uh, if they find nice fields, they come in with big populations of these wild boars and destroy uh, the farmers' uh, crops. So um, that was a reason to say we need to observe these changes in a field on, an, on a timely manner. And here in Thuringia, and I think for many parts of Russia, it's the same. Every In Thuringia, we have every three days, we have a Sentinel-1 acquisition, either ascending, descending, or Sentinel-1A or Sentinel-1B. Yeah, so we get a very nice timeline. And what I wanted to show you here is, again, it is not so easy. It is complex, of course. This is a, a mice, a corn field. Um, because uh, I was going back here, I think it's also a cornfield. The boars love corn. You know, they they eat it. They sleep in it. Um, and so we looked into one of these cornfields. And now what you see here in gray is that's the backscatter over the whole field. So uh, it is not in here. We're not using DB. This was um, just some other. Uh, linear indicator that they use from the C band VH. Yeah, so we do have a lot of variation, even looking at that one field. Um, but we, what, we, what we then highlighted is here this purple line, that's the mean value over, over all our pixels. And the other lines, these are pixels that we identified um, as uh, the pixels showing heterogeneity. So where something is happening. Now, what you can draw from this is, is like an indicator system where you say you're watching the, the mean value, yeah, that purple line over that field, you're watching the mean value. And as soon as you detect a pixel that is deteriorating from that mean value, uh, and you, you follow it up maybe for a week or two, and then um, you can identify that, there, that there's a problem in the field. And, well, the consequence here of such a monitoring system, and now um, you see here the, 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 that would be an NDVI image, and this is a, a kind of radar vegetation, and it, and it shows the deviation from the mean. Yeah, and you see how it correlates with what is detectable in an NDVI. Now, our problem in Thuringia is sometimes we have a, a, a season, a crop season, where we have no clear days and we have always cloud cover. So the Sentinel-2 is not very helpful. There's too many gaps in between the Sentinel-2 acquisition. So we need radar to monitor. And again, that, is, that was your one approach, um, following up the pixels. And, uh, but obviously there are many other pixels as well in, in, that, in that range. So you have to follow it up. Is, is it going back to the mean value or not? And, and just based on the age. And I think coherence was not explored yet, um, but will be the next to look at such deviations. And this is just um, the motivation for, um, yeah, this would be the acquisitions uh, between April and September um, of the uh, Sentinel-2 and uh, well, each, each of the lines, each of the lines here is an acquisition of Sentinel-1. Okay, yeah, this was just in numbers, again, uh, Sentinel-2 numbers for 2017 and 18. And this is the number of Sentinel-1. So obviously very different. Okay, it's just there uh, were two insights. Um, and um, uh, of course, I have shown it here that uh, such things like the Woody cover map are based on regressions with uh, in situ data. So there's, you always need to have uh, training, but uh, one other take home message I would like to say here is that now once you go, once you understand the physical connection uh, between your backscatter signal and the surface feature, then obviously yeah, it's nice and stable and you can apply it the next year or in another area. Okay, to finish up um, uh, the available software uh, that was nicely here put together. And uh, well, you are using here uh, SNP. 
but there's other public domain software available. The commercial, we are working a lot with Gamma, but that needs uh, training. It's a script-based system, but excellent. You can, um, uh, for large area processing and for individual uh, issues that you may have with the data, uh, we really prefer Gamma. Um, I know that uh, Sarscape, I think, is used a lot. Uh, I heard several Russian colleagues using it. Um, uh, it's, of course, very convenient, and it's also a good system. I mean, there, there, there's not, eventually, with the quality, um, not that much different. Then, um, obviously, PCI geom geometrics, and now they are called, I think, the Catalyst um, in Canada. Canada is the radar such country. They have a long history of uh, radar processing. So that is also an excellent um, commercial software. And about Airdas, I cannot say much, but I think they also uh, probably followed up. Um, well, and then there is public domain software, uh, several ones, Alaska SAR facility offering it, uh, Netherlands Delft University is also very active. And there are tutorials here based uh, coming out of Delft in, as part of the EO College webpage. Then public domain SNAP, this is what you are using in your practicals. Uh, there's also a, a massive open online course on this, uh, the Echoes in Space. And then Stanford University, also a traditionally, historically very uh, interferometry uh, uh, focus on that university. And, and then there are research organizations like DLR has their own system, Genesis, Ocnes, Diapason. Um, but um, they are not publicly available. They are only available to uh, members of these research organizations. And um, that, that is just DLR is really leading edge. I mean, they are developers of the Tandemix idea and implementation. And um, this is probably worldwide the best processing system um, to, to my knowledge. But again, you can only access it if you are a DLR member. Okay, and in a list of references, um, please always look up on the EO College uh, what uh, references there are um, and some further reading material. And with this, I want to thank you for your attention on behalf of Professor Michael Einheder and using his slides. Uh, again, they are a common license because uh, he is working with us here on the EO College. But I also like to say uh, goodbye from uh, my team here in, in Vienna. Um, and we do have a strong focus on radar, but uh, also um, on using drones uh, and uh, very high resolution images and segmenting. Um, so uh, yeah, please feel free to contact me and um, yeah, perhaps we can stay in touch. Good, yeah, thanks for your attention. Any further um, questions or comments? Okay, then thanks very much, um, especially to Andre Gardoschko and Marina Ehrlunova uh, for showing their faces. <laughs> uh, great pleasure seeing you, and uh, it's really a pity I, I cannot be with you. Same for Misha, I think we both would have enjoyed uh, meeting you in person and then good luck and um, please yeah, stay in touch with us uh, on your further radar endeavors um, and uh, especially if you have questions um, then uh, please please um, just contact us that's why that's why we're doing the course and hoping to see you well either as guests in Vienna or in Russia Siberia hopefully Paka <laughs> Спасибо. До свидания. До свидания.